Welcome back to Cross Talks. For those of you just joining us, this is a live broadcast produced in collaboration with two of Sweden's leading universities, the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH, and Stockholm University. In addition to you being able to listen to some in impressively smart people, this program also provides a unique opportunity of asking questions of them directly during the broadcast. You can do so towards the end of the show by simply calling us on our Skype address, Crosstalks TV. You can also tell us your opinions on Twitter and talk to us. Our Twitter handle is at Crosstalks TV. Now, I hope you've understood everything I have said so far. But if you haven't, don't worry. There may be a sophisticated scientific explanation for your confusion. Perhaps you were distracted by angry birds or by an angry baby while I was talking. Perhaps English is your second or third or fifth language and requires extra concentration to parse. Today we'll talk about the complex process of language acquisition, of how we first break the code of language when we are very young, and how we add more languages upon our first when we are older, and how today linguistics are, linguists are teaching machines to really understand the power of the human voice. Please welcome Francisco Lachelda, professor at the Department of Linguistics, Stockholm University. Welcome. Uh, Giampiero Salvi, uh, Associate Professor of Computer Science, KTH, welcome. Thank and you. Kenneth Hultenstein, Professor at the Center for Research on Bilingualism, Stockholm University. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Let's start with you, Francisco. Your research is focused on how children learn to use language and how they break the code of communication. Can you briefly describe this process? Well, what uh, infants do is an amazing information processing feat. Um, they manage to pick up the sounds of language, and I don't mean words, I mean the sounds around them, and make sense out of that. So by the end of the second year of life, one and a half, they are able to identify words and start combining them in a way that is communicative. And if you try to do that from just listening to sounds and looking around you, you will realize that you did a very good job when you were an infant, and we all do that. So there is a, a source of information on how we handle this scattered information and how we structure it. So at the very beginning, it's just all the sounds are just mixed up, of course, I'm realizing now as you are explaining this to me. So the, the first thing the baby has to do is to figure out the human sounds. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, you have to focus on uh, what is said, and you have to focus on the situation under which you listen to, the, to those sounds, and uh, somehow you have to negotiate with your environment which sounds you are going to produce and which sounds the environment is producing and how they are going to match each other to refer to things around you. And this is not a very easy thing to do. <laughs> I'll say. I'm sure there are a lot of parents watching now who are thinking, hmm, maybe I could do better with supporting my baby in its language acquisition process. Do you have any tips for them? Well, be present, be observant and... Uh, Put yourself in the in the shoes of, or they don't have shoes, but in, in the, the little socks, in the little socks <laughs> of the <laughs> infants, and see how the world may look like from the infant's perspective. Mm. Moving on to Kenneth, you've specialized in studying people who learn a second language to a very advanced level, and also people who've learned more than six languages. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of your findings? Uh, well, uh, let's first maybe remind us that people can learn languages throughout their life, lifetime. lifetime. Uh, um, uh, but they do it with different success. Um, when you start as a child, you uh, uh, eventually uh, often end up uh, uh, in, at a level where you can be taken as uh, where you can be taken for a, a native speaker of the language. That is w very rare, actually. Uh, with uh, adults uh, when, they, when you start as an adult to learn a second language. Uh, what about uh, 
the people who learn very many languages, <laughs> yeah. are there some common denominators there? Yes. Is it just, are they just naturally more talented as languages? Yes. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, people who learn very many languages uh, uh, um, who are called polyglots or super polyglots even if they learn more than six languages. Um, they are very special people. Um, uh, there, there are certain things they, they, they vary between themselves, of course, a lot. But there are cert certain things that uh, they seem to share. Uh, one is related to the notion of motivation. Um, polyglots seem to uh, have a very burning interest in language and language learning as well. Not only language but lang as a phenomenon, but language learning as well. Um, and this uh, special interest seemed to develop or they, they become aware of it often in late childhood or around puberty. So that is one thing with motivation. Another thing is that uh, they are all very uh, talented in learning languages. And in our research we have uh, measured this with uh, a language aptitude test. And their results on language aptitude tests are uh, way above average. Uh, so I work with uh, 10 polyglots uh, who have learned between a a 7 and 26 languages and uh, they uh, all uh, turn up w w at th this level in, in, uh, in, in a language aptitude test. I'm not sure what that means. Does that mean that, that it's a, there's especially skilled at learning or using? At, 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 at learning languages. At learning languages. Yes, yes. That's yes. interesting. Uh, that's, that, uh, Segues into the next question. Jean Pierre, you work with speech technology. That is, uh, you try to teach machines to talk, uh, which is a lot harder than teaching babies to talk, because they're going to figure it out <laughs> eventually. We, no, in the, in the previous uh, program, in the previous conversation, we heard about uh, research that sounds like science fiction, but this may take the prize. So I'd like to ask here, start here. How close are we in time to machines that we could actually talk to? So in, uh, in the course on speech recognition that I'm teaching here at KTH, I usually start the first lecture by showing uh, a sequence from the famous uh, Stanley Kubrick 2001 Space Odyssey movie. And that's probably one of the most cited films uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence and uh, such. And there you can see this computer, very sophisticated computer, that uh, besides the fact that it cannot make mistakes, that that's probably not very interesting for <laughs> this, but uh, what it does is uh, it engages, engages in uh, very fluent conversations with uh, the, the astronauts in the spaceship. And it's not only talking about the tasks that they have to accomplish, but also about the, the nature of, of humans and uh, uh, and it's it's very um, very good at understanding irony and sarcasm and so on. So that's to show how high the ambition of, of the vision proposed by science fiction is, uh, and has been for many years. And then on the next slide, I have uh, another sequence from a um, recent comedy that is called, I think, now uh, propose you Chuck and Larry or something like mm -hmm. that where one of the main characters, Larry, calls into uh, one of those uh, telephone-based services and um, um, automated system responds and then he spends the next five minutes trying to make the system understand his no name. And that's more or less, I mean, then, of course, most of the students are laughing and that's a way also of, of grabbing their attention, but it, it's, it's not too far from where current systems are. And of course now there has been a very uh, fast improvement in the recent years, but um, uh, looking at this parody is very good for understanding the challenges that, are, that we have to face when, whenever we try to imitate uh, skills that uh, humans have, not only in speech but also so in other... So we've almost cracked getting the machine to parse the sounds that the individual humans are making, at least if the human makes a real effort to speak very clearly. So sometimes that works. Mm. But then it seems that the step to understanding is, is quite far. But is the, is the goal building a HAL, which it seems like a bad idea if you've seen the movie, but, yeah. <laughs> but is, is the goal to actually make machines understand uh, I believe language? that uh, it depends a lot on the kind of applications you have in mind, but 
I think in the future we'll be um, talking more and more about applications where you're actually uh, collaborating with machines. It's not only that you want to um, control them by voice, by giving uh, comments or so, but um, you perhaps you want to uh, use a robot to be, help you build uh, IKEA furniture or something like that. And in that case, there has to be a very um, tight uh, communication between you and the machine. And also, there are other reasons why you cannot possibly use uh, other means of, of input to the machine because your hands are maybe busy and so on. Mm -hmm. And in order to have this tight um, uh, communication with the machine, it's, it's really important that the machine has some understanding of what you are talking about because the, the very mechanical input-output system doesn't really work with humans. We get really uh, annoyed by this kind of interaction. I see. We also have a participant joining us via Skype. Calling in from Silver Spring, Maryland is Michael Long, Professor of Second Language Acquisition at the University of Maryland. Welcome to Crosstalks. Um, Professor Long, you are, among other, other things, credited with introducing what is called the interaction hypothesis, where you stress the importance of face-to-face -face interaction in language acquisition, in humans, I should ask, add. Um, what do you think of this new parenting style, where we bury ourselves in our smartphones instead of, of talking to the kids? The kids can't talk anyway, we think, mm -hmm. and, uh, and go online instead. Oh, no, we don't have sound. Just a moment. Can we have the sound of Professor Long? Let's give it a little second. We can't still hear you. Let's see. Let's see. Is it better now? Yes. yes. Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is that, of course, a lot of people in the world don't have access to that kind of technology, so they're they're not going to be affected one way or the other. For those of us who do have access, I think that uh, it could be a severe disadvantage to young children. Learn learning a language. Um, the, we know that eye contact with children, getting their attention is important, being on the floor with them, I'm talking about infants now, uh, so that they can see you easily and engage with you, is crucial for language learning. Children tend to learn language by trying to do conversation. They don't learn the grammar first and then try to communicate. It's the other way around. Uh, and some people think, by the way, that that's true of adults as well, but perhaps we'll come to that later. The interaction hypothesis uh, seizes on that and says that when adults are trying very hard to communicate with a more proficient interlocutor, for example, a teacher of the language, whether they're a native speaker or not, and both people are focused on the task that they're trying to do, then selective attention, in other words, what the, what the learner is focusing on linguistically, is linked with that effort to communicate. Let me give you a simple example. Suppose you have a teacher in some sort of content-based or language immersion classroom, and they're talking about Napoleon invading Russia. Uh, the teacher might say, when did Napoleon invade Russia? And a student uh, offers a reply and says uh, something like, Napoleon invade in 1812. And the teacher then responds, that's right, in 1812. Napoleon invaded in 1812. Mm -hmm. And implicitly, the teacher has provided has provided the corrected version of invade, has given the past tense form of it, invaded. And there's lots of studies showing that so-called corrective recasts, which is what these things are known as, uh, are excellent for language learning. They're not a, not a panacea, but learners can pick up on as much as 60%. And there you disappeared again. I'm sorry, the sound has just disappeared again. So let's, the interaction hypothesis. Am I, now, am I back again? Now you're back again, yes. But, the, again. but the, let's say, that, so the interaction hypothesis, that sounds, that sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Would yeah. that, does it also work with infants then? Should we oh. give them the corrected version back? Oh, well, yeah, then maybe we not toddlers it. once they start speaking. We do that. Do we? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, yes. I'm, I'm not yes. aware of this process. If you, if you are you communicating, you, are, you do that implicitly. Mm. So it's not, it's not even something that you have to train to do. I mean, you just That's right. do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so uh, as long as you are present, as you are in the scene and you are interacting with the infant and having eye-to-eye -eye communication, so you do that. <laughs> But 
I, I wonder how what what do you guys think about about the, the the smartphone thing? It's been it's been in the news a lot lately. The the idea that we're ruining our children by by not giving them our full attention. But at the same time, I think historically, cert, surely people had to go to work with their kids and all kinds of things where their attention where there was not always a human with their full attention on the child. How dangerous is is it not to be a, a language providing machine at all times? Well, I, I would be a little skeptical putting it in dangerous terms like that because uh, this is a matter of uh, scale of uh, damage or uh, mm -hmm. the path of the um, of the development language development. So I would say that um, it's not it doesn't uh, make it an optimal uh, language learning setting. But uh, we humans are very good at finding other. Uh, paths and it has consequences. We don't know really wha what the consequences are, but um, but it, it's not damaging in that sense that oh now we cannot talk or we can. I mean it, it's a matter of we have to be pretty sort of um, uh, sound in our judgment because it's not it's not a recipe. I, you do like that and you succeed or you do like. I'm, I'm realizing something as you're as you're talking about this, which is that the the reverse, of course, is for what we've just learned about language acquisition. Is that you do need somebody who reacts. So you can't just put the kid in front of a television and say they'll pick up language. Yeah, That's not going to work. No, not not very much, at least in the beginning. It doesn't. In fact, we we know that that's, that doesn't work very. Well. Mm -hmm. We know that doesn't work very well. That's actually very interesting because that's why how we try to teach machines to talk. Mm -hmm. It's just by uh, feeding them with large amounts of data and annotated data saying this sentence um, uh, includes this number of words in this sequence and so on, and we expect them to, to learn something out of it. That's and not of course working they very do. well, is it? They, they, of course, they do some mapping between words and sounds, but that's not enough. It's not really the way children do, and there are lots of uh, challenges that we have to start working with if we want to, machines to improve over what they've already achieved. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that the point of communicating is to share views about the world and about what you have around you. So uh, when you take this uh, example from machines uh, that are very much focused on the, the speech signal uh, itself, you are missing the variance that you have uh, in uh, real life situations where you have uh, uh, a, a wide range of affordances and uh, uh, things that the, the both parts can pick up on. Mm -hmm. And that gives uh, a very, very valuable uh, background information that it's not visible immediately. It's there somehow. And if you have an intelligent uh, human being uh, uh, behind uh, that uh, mass of data, you can mm. navigate in that mm. because you have a complete sensory Yeah, so, uh, so when we're talking about yeah. context, quite often we're actually yeah. talking about shared experiences. And, 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 and when you're breaking it down, language acquisition, you're breaking it down to things like sight lines and eye contact. And we're speaking about this object that we're looking at. Really, or it's in a wider context where the human body is experiencing things together. Yeah. And that's where the communication is happening. I see, Kenneth. Uh, one, one thing to remember also is that children are quite robust when it comes to picking up languages, actually. They, they seem to do it even in fairly uh, limited circumstances. Uh, they are so motivated of learning the language that is spoken by the environment. So that is one, one thing also to, 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 to think of, of course. But, but I think when, 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 the, when there is a problem with the cell phone, uh, uh, um, the, the use of cell phones, for example, is when when children's attention are not uh, addressed at all. So, so that when the child is wanting to communicate or is in need of communicating, uh, if if the environment then doesn't doesn't notice that or don't care, doesn't care about it, I think that is where it's a, a bad experience for the child. I read about an experiment, which I think is quite famous, where there is a robot somewhere, somewhere in Europe, I, I think, which, which scientists are trying to teach 
language by a sort of human method, so that you're, they're teaching them little, there's a reward signal, basically, and then the, the, the robot has a mother that speaks to it. Is, uh, is, this, is, this work, is this true, and also is it working? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We have an experiment <laughs> similar to that. I don't know if that's the one you're referring we to. That. You're so, doing that, yeah? How, so how the, does the that idea happen? with that, uh, if it's the same you're referring to, uh, the idea there was to try to use all possible uh, sensors from the robot, so not, not only feeding it with uh, audio data and trying to make it map it to some classes like words and so on, but to have it uh, interact in an environment and play with certain toys, and then uh, an external person would describe what was happening in the scene. And the robot could use the, the cameras as eyes and some tactile sensors, uh, and of course, uh, microphones for years and so on. And he was trying to make sense of all these inputs at the same time. So what he was trying to achieve was to build some sort of uh, an understanding of the whole environment where uh, speech and language were only a part of it. So it was uh, a description of what was going on. But uh, from the beginning, he didn't know. It just had all these inputs, and he had to make sense of them to, to find um, associations between them. I think it's lovely. But did it work? Does it work? It, it did work for a very, very constrained uh, case that we... I mean, of course, we designed the experiment in a way that was so simple that we hoped it would work. But of course, if you take that robot now and you put it in a real environment, the same way as, as a child is learning, it has no, uh, no chance of learning anything because the, the real uh, environments that children are... are um, faced with, they are mm -hmm. so much more noisy than what we can uh, define in, in the laboratory uh, that we really need much more efficient methods for learning, um, for making these robots learn in order to cope with that complexity. Yeah. And I'm, I'm realizing, of course, that the baby's brain, uh, we are not traditionally super impressed, we laymen are not super impressed with the thought pro powers of babies, but it's a super mm. computer optimized to solve this specific task, so we also can't build the machine equivalent of a baby's wow. brain yet. Or? But no, not you're yet, saying, of oh, course. You're saying, no, we can, <laughs> can we? Well, uh, uh, that's a very wide <laughs> issue there, I would that's say. That's how we roll here. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, because um, uh, if we look at uh, infants' behaviors, they do also lots of mistakes. They do also lots of um, errors uh, that are similar to the wrong extrapolations that uh, a robot uh, or these models uh, do. Um, but then you have uh, a continuum of um, uh, exposure and you have sleep and structuring of information mm -hmm. from uh, that you were exposed to during the day so and you have action uh, from the infant that is not modeled in a, a voluntary way so to say for, in a robot i mean there is uh, the infant has a goal uh, seems to be uh, of exploring things. For, for instance, if I look at the table there and you, you have a, a bottle there on the table and if I don't know if the bottle is separate object from the table, I, I can push it like infants do and uh, I see that it falls down and then it was an object. And the same thing you do with the, with the word as a part of a sound string. I mean, you don't know mm, if, it's, right. uh, if that part is valid, but if you can use it, and uh, uh, because you picked up somehow, or you just happen to have the facility of uh, being able to produce ba, 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 pa, 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 those are phonetic trivialities, uh, then uh, if you get something back on that, then you are identifying, so, so to say, a sound object. And and then you are building on that, but you have to have action and so, and that's not really what, uh, I mean, it's more difficult to... Uh, I'm realizing this yeah. whole conversation is, is completely changing how I will interact with babies <laughs> in the future. <laughs> also, I'm realizing that if you could build a robot that would have this kind of independent action, it would be a very annoying to be around because it would try <laughs> well, everything. Just like a baby. <laughs> just like a baby, I'm realizing, that's right. <laughs> Let's move back to, uh, to language acquisition in adults. So Kenneth and Michael, I, if... Let's say tomorrow I get the urge to learn Swahili or Tagalog or some other language that is not related to the two languages that I grew up with. What are my chances of becoming fluent? 
I'm 35 years old, if that matters. I don't know. Yes. Kenneth, let's start here. <laughs> of course, it depends on what you mean by being fluent in a language. Um, uh, I would say that you can be fluent without having a native accent or, and also with some grammatical errors, for example. Uh, at least you can be communicatively uh, as effective as a first language speaker of, uh, of, of the language. But it's very difficult to predict in individual cases, especially with adults. Uh, adults are very different in uh, how they acquire new languages. Uh, some succeed very well and others uh, don't succeed very well. And uh, there are many, many factors involved in, in that, of course, motivation, aptitude, the uh, uh, context for learning, the opportunity of being exposed to the language and many other things. So it's very difficult with adults to predict where you would end up. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say that uh, in, 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 in many cases you can really, uh, as, as, as we see people speaking second languages here, you can end up uh, at a level where you are uh, communicatively very effective, but maybe not uh, native-like in the language. I would predict that you wouldn't be totally native-like. Michael, would you like to add something? Yes, I, I just, I mean, Kenneth is very modest, but he and uh, Nicholas Abraham Hanson and uh, Mane Bielund have done excellent, excellent work at Stockholm on this very topic. Studies of Chilean immigrants to Sweden, for example, who've lived there for many, many years. Uh, I think in one study they had something like 160 people, 40 of them or 41 of them passed as native when small speech segments were played to native speakers of Swedish. Uh, but once they were subjected to what Kenneth and his colleagues call scrutinized linguistic ability, uh, none of them passed as native speakers. And that's been the result we have got here in Maryland, too. Uh, a particularly brilliant young Spanish-Catalan bilingual uh, graduate from our program, uh, Gisela Graniena, and I just published a study looking at Chinese immigrants to Spain who'd lived there for at least 10 years, had plenty of opportunity, and we found the same thing. None of the uh, late starters defined as people who arrived uh, after 16 years of age. None of them achieved anything like native speaker levels. And the other interesting thing in our study, and in many, most of the literature, in fact, is that it's not just one biological constraint that sets in at a particular age, but a series, a consecutive sensitive period, such that the first thing to go in terms of your chances of acquiring native-like levels is phonology, then lexis and collocations, and then morphology and syntax. Could you so just that translate that to those of us who are not linguists? So what's the first sure. Go. It, it seems that, for the, that there's a period of optimal sensitivity for language learning when most of it is done incidentally, mm -hmm. in other words, without intention and implicitly without awareness that you're doing it. That's what children are using mostly with first language acquisition, mostly, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but once people get beyond that age, the percentage of effort that's actually involved switches and uh, it seems to be inadequate for the task. Adults seem to lose a lot of the ability, not completely, but a, a certainly a lot of the ability to do what's called incidental learning. In other words, just picking up uh, arbitrary sound meaning connections like in vocabulary items and collocations, you know, which particular words go together. Is, is a table feminine or masculine in this language? Anything that's mm -hmm. arbitrary like that, uh, we're not very good at if you start too late. So in the first six years of life, if people start a second or even a third language, they can, not will, but can become native-like if they get sufficient exposure, say 10 years or more. But after that, the prognosis deteriorates rapidly. For lexis and collocation, so learning the vocabulary of an L2, which words go together with higher than usual frequency, that ability seems to decline at about age nine, roughly, we think, although there's been less research there. Uh, and morphology and syntax, so the grammar of the language, if mm. you like, we can handle that later. People have been noted to start to, to achieve native-like levels starting as late as 14 or 15. But that is really interesting because now in, in the reverse flip side of, the, of all the smartphones and the, the ubiquitousness, see there I... I'm pretty sure I just revealed that I'm not a native speaker of English. Uh, of, of smartphones and tablets ha has the reverse effect that a lot of children, for instance, here in the Nordic countries, are starting out very early with English. Somebody like me, I grew up in Finland, but I, I would have been exposed to a lot of English from maybe around age six on television. Um, but 
I think I, I, now I hear, just anecdotally, I, I meet kids as young as three and four who are picking up a lot of English of YouTube and Netflix and, mm -hmm. and things like this because they are used to babysit. So clearly some kind of, a, a, a fragment of this mm -hmm. at least goes in. What do you think will happen with our English levels because of this, Kenneth? Yeah, I think I think you can see this if you look over generations uh, that uh, the, the the level of English for Swedish speakers, for example, uh, is is becoming more native-like. I mean, it, it seems that young people are more able to pronounce English in 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 more native in in a, a more native-like way than, than than older Swedes who speak uh, speak English. Um, uh, but but still, I think uh, it doesn't it, it, it doesn't mean that the the level of English will be uh, the same as uh, that of native speakers in in an English speaking country because English is still a very limited language here. We have much less exposure, even if we have a lot of exposure. But still, uh, uh, that doesn't uh, make the whole the whole uh, cake, um, mm. t t so to speak. Uh, we, 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 will, we will probably never be uh, 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 totally native speakers of English as long as we have Swedish as our main language in, in the country. Mm. Um, Jean Piero, what can robots and computers teach us about the nature of human language? <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's a very interesting question because one of the reasons why we do this research is not only to develop uh, systems, uh, computers and robots that can interact with us, but also to reveal some of the um, uh, problems that humans are faced with when they try to learn a language. So um, that's probably the, the most... Um, uh, le the, the biggest lesson that we can learn is when we try to actually uh, simulate this behavior in uh, uh, artifacts, then we really understand uh, how difficult it is. And this has been a problem in the past, with, especially in the field of artificial intelligence, because of a uh, paradox that uh, things that are very easy for humans are usually very hard for computers and the other way around. And this is because the, those things that we feel are easy are not actually easy at all. It's just that we do them unconsciously uh, and we don't realize the difficulty. And so we don't realize how hard it is to, to speak because we don't pay attention to all the details of how we speak. Um, and trying to simulate this behavior in, uh, in computers and robots uh, can teach us to understand the full complexity of what we are dealing with. I think it's interesting because all of you are working on, on, on the same problem. It just, you're just attacking it from different directions. But if, if we do solve the mystery of human language acquisition, what would change? Well, it's uh, enormous insight on how intelligent systems handle information that is available out there and how they navigate in that. So that's, uh, I would say, the, uh, the key for... Uh, uh, an intelligent structuring of uh, the world around you. So that there is oh, a, yeah. a, a a big resource there that um, I think uh, companies should uh, understand better. <laughs> the, it's thought of humanistic uh, research, so that's not well, babies. Mm -hmm. That's soft things. So, but uh, there is a an enormous potential there. That, you were uh, saying there is an enormous financial potential in, in figuring uh, out how we treat concepts I, and ideas. I don't mean financial, probably yes, but I mean uh, in terms of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have to address uh, ground research questions and we have to address them now in order to be able to address a problem that may appear or not in the future, but knowledge is fundamental. and. Uh, here we have a, a unique source of uh, knowledge, and people have recognized that within humanities for a, a few decades now. Uh, but um, I think it's amazing that it's not projected uh, to uh, more to engineering. This project that Gian Piero was talking about was an attempt to combine these things. Uh, but uh, would it's it, still. Uh, would it make it easier? I, will it? Will it make it? Once you guys solve this, will it make it easier to learn languages? But uh, but you, 
Well, you may ask that question, but I think the fundamental issue is to understand the process. Mm -hmm. And then if it can be applied for something like, uh, well, having a shortcut to learn a language, that's a good thing, good or bad. But, but it's, a, it's a possible thing. But I do see the, the value, but yeah. also funders will want to know what <laughs> yes, we're going to use this yes, for. Yes, and that's yes. part of the problem. It because is. all these things are, are seen in, in sort of a five years uh, uh, revenue yeah. <laughs> uh, project, and that, that's it? bad. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with, with, with Francisco about uh, we want to understand the processes and uh, uh, we are not immediately thinking of the uh, application. But there is a, a tradition in second language research to uh, link to discussions about language teaching especially. And of course, the more we understand of, uh, of the process of learning a second language, the better we can adapt the teaching to, to people and, and the variety between people. I, I think that is an interesting issue. Uh, coming back to the polyglots, for example, mm -hmm. another thing that, is, that is, uh, seem to be, seems to be uh, a, 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 a common denominator among the ten I've been looking at is that they are particularly interested in uh, language as a system. So when, 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 when they are confronted with, with statements like, uh, when I learn the language, I'm fascinated with uh, the uh, grammatical rules of the language, all of them totally agree. And if they, for example, uh, there is a statement saying that uh, when I read a text, I immediately notice if it's grammatically correct or not. They totally agree. And, and the, the, this group of learners are uh, specific in the way that they seem to, to use explicit learning much more than the average, even adult learner. So talking about uh, communication and the role of communication in uh, second language learning, it's of course uh, necessary, but, but different individuals use it to a larger or lesser extent. Polyglots seem to read grammars and uh, lexicons and learn languages mostly in that way. So if I can, if I can go back to the question of which are the applications, I, I think I can list quite a few <laughs> coming from the engineering world. But it's also a problem of uh, the applications that we are trying to develop. We mm, are sort of um, getting stuck stuck in the fact that we uh, have seen improvements just by adding data and computer uh, power to, the, to our methods. So the problem is that it's very hard to motivate this kind of research because people say, okay, but just use, instead of uh, 1,000 uh, hours of, sp of speech recordings, you use 2,000 instead that you get better results. So mm -hmm. what's the point? But the problem is that this, this is reaching a limit. And so it's really important that we can um, uh, explain that it's not possible to go much uh, more beyond this and that the people that are financing research understand that we should do things that actually have uh, uh, worse results for mm -hmm. the time being, being before we can go uh, beyond that what we have now. And this has been a real problem also in engineering, not, not only in... Uh, Linguistics, and because it, it's it's very easy to demand that you should have the same uh, results as the big company that is developing mm -hmm. this speech recognizer, but it's not the way you improve uh, at this point. Yes. Then now you're all going to think that my next question is terribly trivial, I think. But but since we do see a lot of advancements in in different kinds of computer translation between between mm -hmm. human languages, and also even speech recognition is coming slowly. Uh, and, and combined with speech syn syn synthesizer, we are envisioning that the Babelfish vision that you can just have a little machine that will translate for you. Uh, will this make second language learning additional languages completely irrelevant? Uh, will we reach a point, let's say, in our lifetime where machine translation will be so good that I don't need to learn French? Michael. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm not the best qualified to answer that. I think the, a computer science person should be should be asked. I have a lot to say about the previous question. Do that um, instead. Yeah. We'll return to this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On on that previous question, I agree with the, with the panelists that we, second language acquisition and first are, are fundamental areas of cognitive science. So that whatever we find out about things like maturational constraints on the human ability to learn languages tells us something absolutely fundamental about the human mind, what it's capable of, what its limitations are. But here at the university of Maryland, we're particularly interested in these applications that you brought up. Uh, and if I can give you a couple of examples, we have a Center for Advanced Study of Language and a brand new Language Sciences Center, which are looking into um, very interesting applications of this kind of research. For example, uh, the Center for the Advanced Study of Language has developed a brand new measure of language aptitude. It's taken seven years to do it, uh, but it in, involves recent findings in, in cognitive science, and it looks like it's being um, rolled out for not only for lots of government uh, departments, but eventually into academia as well. And generally also, we have people um, looking at how uh, various aspects that SL, second language acquisition has shown are relevant to language learning, such as short-term memory, can be trained, such as to, to improve language aptitude, so we could actually make people better language learners. And then the last area that is being uh, investigated seriously at CASEL and in the Language Science Center, or one of the last areas, is uh, what are called aptitude treatment interaction studies. Now that we know better how to identify different aptitudes that people bring to the language learning task, can we match the way we teach them languages to those aptitude profiles? Implicitly, better language learners, for example, might prefer lessons that appeal to that side of them, whereas explicit learners uh, may want the same material presented explicitly. Uh, and a question I would have to Kenneth, by the way, about his polyglots, I think a very interesting one, is whether... Uh, the language learners having high aptitude, these polyglots having high aptitude, is cause or effect. In other words, are they, do they have high aptitude and that's why they learn so many languages successfully? Or does the high aptitude come as a result of them having learned so many languages successfully? Yeah. Kenneth? It's, it's a very interesting question and, and uh, I don't know the answer. Um, uh, uh, that, that is uh, uh, something that, 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 that is, is beyond the, the possibility of, of investigating in, 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 in this group of, uh, uh, of uh, people, of course. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there is the discussion of, of, of aptitude uh, generally, uh, whether it is a fixed feature of a person uh, or not. And there has been a lot of discussion about this uh, during uh, uh, recent years. Uh, it was assumed once to be uh, a much more fixed feature, and uh, I think most people still think it's 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 uh, to some extent uh, I individually relevant, but <clears throat> but it's also something that maybe is possible to, to change. There is one thing with the polyglots; they are so interested in in, in linguistics, in in grammar, in different languages. They learn a lot about how languages can be structured. So when they learn a new language, they use a lot of their metalinguistic awareness, their, their linguistic knowledge, uh, in order to be able to, to, to quickly grasp how this new language is, is structured, and that helps them a lot in, in their learning. It's time for audience questions. I think uh, this is the one time when nobody needs to be shy about sounding like you're speaking a foreign language. <laughs> uh, does anybody have anything on their mind? Yes, please. Good evening. Mm, thank you. Uh, actually, I have two questions. My Briefly, first question yeah. is about two typical or very special uh, languages. The, the first one is the non, uh, just the verbal languages, which are just spoken. There is no writing, for mm -hmm. example, for these languages. Uh, how is the, the process of learning this, this language, for example? Uh, the, second, the second part of, or the second type of languages is just the written one, like uh, uh, programming languages or something like this. It's very uh, interesting, yeah. Yeah, the second uh, question is, what is the impact of learning a language on the human, human brain? Or, uh, I mean, the impact, is, is there a special impact? Or if, for example, someone learned more than five languages or six languages, 
Is Thank there you. a special impact? Thank you. Those are very good questions. Let's start with the first one. Uh, some languages are only spoken. Some languages are only textual in different ways. Uh, how are, does anybody have any reflections on, on this? Kenneth? Well, the, the first thing is that uh, maybe that, that uh, languages that are, that are not written is more or less the, the, the normal state of affairs yeah. if we look at it historically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's for a brief period of time that languages have been written, and we are so used to writing languages, uh, so, so that is one thing. And, and, and before, before languages were written, uh, it's uh, reasonable to think, as it is in, in, in those parts of the world where many languages are spoken that are not written, that people learn each other's languages, uh, I mean, in, in communication and uh, with of course, different kinds of reflections, uh, depending on age and things like that. Um, but the other one, about more written or program, programming languages and so on, maybe I should not uh, talk about so much. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm the one. <laughs> uh, actually, programming languages share some of the, the properties of uh, natural languages, but uh, I mean, there are even um, dialects of, of the same programming language, uh, language and so on. So there are, there are a lot of things in common. But one property that is very different from uh, natural languages is that they are not ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So the, you always have to know exactly the meaning of, of the statements you're, you're writing. So I, I suspect I don't know much about how... Uh, research about how people learn programming languages. Maybe that's something that you could... <laughs> but uh, I would suspect that there are some differences there because it's, uh, it's a much more um, uh, strict uh, way of learning, probably. Though it would seem that some of the, the learning, the, the skill set that you've des des described using your meta-linguistic abilities, that, that would be similar. Yeah. The more programming languages you know, the, mm. the easier it is yes, to exactly. grasp uh, the more. Francisco? Uh, uh, my thoughts go for the sense of uh, linguistic com uh, well, communication. And uh, I would say that uh, the, what is the core uh, goal of uh, communicating is actually given by the, either the verbal language or sign language. But it, it is, um, and, and that is not a static thing. So um, if you uh, connect that to the written language, written language uh, has some sort of uh, uh, component, introduce a component of formalism. In, in, I mean, you, how you spell things, it's based on a reflection about uh, what contrasts you have, what contrasts you need in a language. So there is a um, uh, whole philosophy behind the orthographic conventions, and that's a convention with the goal of keeping things less fluid than they naturally are. And then you start doing mistakes or uh, taking uh, borrowing words from uh, another language and you start introducing changes even in the written language. Mm -hmm. So it sort of uh, starts diverging. But I would say that when you look at language and uh, communication with language, you should look at something like an um, uh, unstable system that is kept uh, in a sort of um, a working point that is more or less uh, okay, but uh, that is not static. So it's a dynamic balance that you have all the time. And the less you have of external reference, for instance, when you have contact groups that don't have a, a, a formal uh, written language and they are just have verbal things, well, if they are far away from each other, they yeah. tend to diverge. If, they are, uh, if there is an influence of uh, the other group, they adopt the other groups uh, because there is not um, a reference so core. So the, the, the uh, written language also serves to standardize over large yes, geographical that, that, areas. That's, that's, right. that's the point, yeah. to make it and uh, the language, timeless. That's right. yeah. Makes, uh, let's uh, um, move to the second question. What happens in the brain? Uh, we've seen some really interesting reports in the last year that uh, bilingual people, uh, their, their brains, when they age, as they, be, as they age, their brains seem to, to uh, function longer when they're struck with things like Alzheimer's disease, that, that the brain, brain seems to uh, develop alternative paths, but that is only for people who are b bilingual from childhood. Um, do, do you know anything about the impacts on the brain of, of uh, learning later? Kenneth. Uh, 
It's, 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 it's an, an issue that is not totally clear, but uh, I have one interesting uh, example of this. And uh, it's a polyglot who actually lived uh, until the 1930s, and his brain was preserved. Uh, so uh, his, his name was uh, Emil Krebs in Germany. Uh, he learned uh, very many languages. He was fluent, it, it said, in 68 languages. <laughs> And he worked in China as a, a diplomat, uh, but but uh, his brain has been investigated in the nineteen in in, in 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 the last decade because it was preserved and it was compared to the brain of non polyglots, uh, normal male brains, and uh, there were several differences in his brain compared to the other other ones' brains. Uh, especially in Briefly, the. Briefly, please. We're running out of time. Yes, I see. <laughs> especially in in the symmetry between the right and left hemisphere, so both the right and left hemisphere had larger uh, uh, cytoarchitecture um, patterns in 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 both hemispheres in different places, uh, which was then discussed that it, it might be an, an effect of the fact that he learned so many languages. There were so many uh, network connections uh, in these parts of the brain. Thank so you. And there you have also answered my previous question, which is that there, is a, there, there seems to be, an in, uh, we seem to have a great interest or a great reason to keep learning languages, even though machines could potentially do that for us. This is all we have time for in this part of the conversation. Thank you so much. Michael Long, Francisco Lacerda, Kenneth Hiltenstam uh, and Jean Piero Salvi, sorry, crosstalks. We'll be back within minutes, returning for our final talk of the evening. This episode will revolve around crime. See you again on the hour, 7 p.m. CET. Thank you. <laughs>